Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Frank Holmes and Aiden Killick of Hive Blockchain. We talk about Hive's 2022, including the Ethereum merge and the Intel-based Buzz Miner. Mainly, we focus on Hive's internal culture, including its focus on maintaining margins and controllable risks. Frank, Aiden, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. It's been a minute. We need to have you guys on the show for sure. We we write about you quite often in our mining memo, so it's great to have both of you guys on the show. Thanks again. Well, thank you for the opportunity, and welcome our new CEO, Aiden Gillick. Aiden, yeah, welcome to the show. Let's, talk, let's start off there. Uh, we were just actually talking about that, and I should have hit the record button, but you know, it happens with podcasting. You don't always hit press, press the button in time. Let's talk about the leadership shuffle that just occurred Frank, you were just uh, explaining it to me. Uh, you built Hive with the, the idea of building a Bitcoin ETF, and then Hive came about. And now over the last few weeks, you guys have moved Iden into the CEO role. You've moved back into the executive chairman role, uh, both important purposes, but different uh, different focuses at Hive. I don't hand it off to you, though, first. Uh, tell me a little bit about Hive and for our audience who might not be familiar with Hive. And then tell me a little bit about your new role as CEO. Oh, to myself, yeah, absolutely. So Hive is a first public Bitcoin miner ever, actually. And when I saw Hive go public back in 2017, I thought it was actually a remarkable concept because I thought Bitcoin mining was the perfect business to be a publicly traded company and that, you know, you had access to growth capital, it's highly scalable, and, you know, you were creating, uh, you know, a scarce digital asset. So I actually founded my own company, uh, took it public, ran as CEO for a few years, and Frank and I met on a panel in from January 2018 in Vancouver. And I was it was interesting because it was the, the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. And Frank's photo was everywhere. I'm like, holy <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm going on a panel with this guy. And uh Frank was very cordial and and immediately I, I just thought like, wow, like he's a legend in the capital markets. And we became industry friends. And uh, you know, we'd navigated uh, bear markets uh, you know, 2019 and 2020. Uh, was not a popular year to be a crypto miner. And then uh, in 2021, we, we started collaborating in a more professional capacity. Uh, but really, um, you know, Hive is a story of first. It's the first green, first crypto miner ever to go public, first to uh, be green energy focused, first to put data centers on the balance sheet, uh, which Frank grew through some very strategic M&As in the last bear market by acquiring part of the shoot facility and, and GP1. Uh, and... Uh, we're the first to, we were the world's largest Ethereum miner. Um, we also ha, are the first company to build, bring its own uh, Bitcoin ASIC to the market. Uh, well, we're not selling them, we're deploying them in our own data centers, and that's a collaboration with Intel. And so it's really a technology company. Uh, and we've been focusing on mining digital assets, but we are also looking at taking that to the next level, right? So we've been doing a bunch of heat recapture initiatives. So just this morning, I had a conference call with a uh, NASDAQ-listed greenhouse developer based out of Sweden, and they're going to be building a, a greenhouse right next to our data center in Bowdoin, and we're going to be using heat transfer technology to grow cucumbers and tomatoes, right? So we were talking about permitting and you know rights of access uh, to, to get all the infrastructure sorted out. Uh, we also have a, a, a fledgling uh, HPC project because we have one of the world's largest fleets of NVIDIA data center great GPUs. And so we're actually we're actually earning revenue from this, but we haven't really started talking about it in the media yet. So there's so many things, exciting things happening in the Hive um, multiverse. Uh, it's it's really about um, you know getting the story out there so people can understand. Like we have an amazing team of coders, you know, our network technicians, and uh, you know Frank has just been a legend in the capital markets for decades upon decades. So. With his stewardship as an executive uh, chairman, uh, and uh, you know our, our de decentralized, no pun intended, team of you know crypto miners. All you know, we're in Sweden. We got coders in Croatia. We've got guys in Montreal, New Brunswick, Iceland. Um, it it's uh, it's it's a very um, unparalleled team, in my opinion. And so it's a privilege and honor to be uh, working with with everybody. Well, thank you for the profile there, Frank. I'll hand it down to you. Same sort of question. Uh, just like what's been going on and the change, the leadership change, and well, I, I, what I, you focus on now. 
I was only, you know, I took on the responsibility of being the interim CEO because it was a crypto winner and it was about, you know, surviving with the CFO and one other person in Europe to turn around this company and, and, uh, uh, and we did. Uh, and, and so when we started to grow and make acquisitions, in particular the GPU one, we just realized, you know, we had to beef up the team. But something else that we did in, before GPU one came along is we, we partnered with the utility company to do standby. Uh, so they needed electricity and they paid us. We were first, it was, became free cash flow. Uh, and, and then why it started doing it in Texas. But it, for us, it was another a source of income coming in, just like the HPC. So the HPC is doing $2,000 a day is nothing. But when it hits $10,000 a day, it's 300000 a month. Okay, now we'll talk about it as being really, you know, in our financial, because it, 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 moves, it moves the dial. Our, our, my rule of thumb is we'll move the dial by a penny. So we need to have about $900,000 uh, of, of revenue. Uh, you got to think of it, that's now a penny. So until we get to that number, that's sort of the disciplines. But I was thrilled about setting up because I come from the mutual fund world and ETFs. We live in a world that's very structured and there are lots of governance and et cetera. So some of those things have you know been embedded into high. Uh, and, and I think that some of the other mistakes from other companies, uh, especially in the lending world, uh, the shadow banks of the world, uh, there was no governance. So Hive has great governance. And we also started the discipline of agility management, formalized of how do you build out software and you have scrums and you have huddles. And so one of the things we did do every day is that we huddle every morning over seven time zones for 30 minutes and want to know what the machines are plugged in, why they're not plugged in, what was our production every day and it creates a focus a real focus and then everyone goes on going out to build the business uh and so from that end i create this structure uh and Aiden is being an engineer uh has embraced it uh he has shown great leadership in in the gp1 acquisition and building out the facilities and so now it's time it's time for me to step back uh and and for him to be um, uh, the CEO uh, of, of a business, and and I'm so delighted and, and thrilled that uh, uh, he's 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 hungry, he's ambitious, uh, and and he's very thoughtful. So this helps us to position us to go to the next level. Let's go back into 2022 uh, for those who are still like learning about Hive or interested in what you guys have done. 2022 was obviously very tough for a lot of Bitcoin miners. Uh, you guys excelled during that, even though there were some things that could have been a problem, right? So one thing that came up during the year was the merge. And as you noted, you guys are a big Ethereum miner and you guys had to transition away from that uh, mining revenue. Let's start there. Let's talk about uh, the merge and moving away from Ethereum revenue. And then after that, let's talk about the Intel chips, which you guys have already mentioned. But Frank, I'll throw it back to you. Tell me about the Ethereum mining uh, pathway and how you guys got there and then uh, what it looks like right now. It, it, Ethereum was... To such a high profit margin business and it was very um, simple and easy for us to manage and uh, and we didn't think the merge would come through until probably 23 uh, because it'd been going on now for five years it was going to come out every, all the time and so we just stayed focused on it but when that journey when it started heating up we started pivoting of saying you know what are these new chips worth what are the nvidia chips worth uh, and, and so can we create another source of revenue from them? And, and, and that was the whole idea of the HPC. Uh, and we're happy. It always is. We haven't hired a bunch of people with it. It was slow getting off the ground, but we have two strategic partnerships in Europe. Um, I would say three, one would be, you know, bought and fall the utility company. Uh, I would say barrage out of Croatia and, um, uh, block base out of, uh, uh, Vienna. Uh, and, and we talk every day. There's, there's, there is that huddle every morning and then there's other meetings with it. So they are the ones that have been helping us do the pivoting from other sources of revenue, selling back our energy or balancing the grid or now HPC. Love that. Aiden, any other thoughts on Ethereum mining and, and transitioning away from that, maybe from an operator side? The best way to think about like having, having a real interest in kind of understanding of 
uh, we're like you could say we're in the hash rate commodity business, right? That's how some miners describe it. And that's good if you're just focused on that one thing. But we actually are, you know, a resource management company in a lot of ways because one resource we manage is energy, right? And if you look at our January production report, we were mining with ASICs, we were mining with GPUs, and we were also selling energy back to the grid. So we made 180 grand selling energy back to the grid. And that was more profitable than mining. And GPU, uh, we were mining Bitcoin with our GPUs through all coins. And then, of course, we're mining ASICs. If you look at December, we did 3.1 million of selling energy back to the grid. No GPU mining and ASIC mining, right? So we have this, this, these resources uh, and we did decide, okay, are we going di- to divert the energy to hash rate through our ASICs, through our GPUs, or back to the every, grid? Every day is a huddle for that. Yeah. yeah, every day is a huddle. Like our, our Excel spreadsheets would, would blow your mind uh, and uh, in a good way. And uh, at, like we have so many hyper intelligent guys on the team that bring different skill sets. And then on the, uh, you know, in terms of professionalism as, as a public company, we also are hedging our energy contracts, right? So a lot of players um, who are getting uh, fried and roasted when energy prices uh, skyrocketed, um, you were seeing production numbers um, drop off or people mining at a loss or, you know, going bankrupt. Uh, we we always put ourselves in a position where um, either if we could sell energy back to the grid for profit, or in some cases, if we can't, we ensure that our contract allows us to simply uh, reduce our operating capacity, right? And you the other resource is capital, right? So we deployed capital to buy 3,500, 3,570 S19J pros at an average price of $11 a terahash. And a year ago, there were 111. Exactly. And so the thing is, is the ROI that you, you should be solving for as a mathematical equation when you're a crypto miner um, is primarily, there's, it's a multivariate equation, right, that we model in 3D. And the primary, the primary variable is your capex on your, your ASICs, more over than machine efficiency, more over than your electrical price. And so we always solve for our best ROI. That's why we have the highest return cash flow and invested capital, right? Because if you can't just go to Mr. Market and pull the lever and get another $100 million, are you going to make your money back on what the investment that you made? That's what you have to think. And not all the crypto miners are doing that. And as you can see, that's why so many people go bankrupt. And people say it's economies of scale. No, it's economies of efficiency. You can be a thousand megawatts and unprofitable or a hundred megawatts and profitable, which one do you want? Right, it's like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The biggest of the big w- went mm-hmm. bankrupt this year, almost right. And so it's understanding the intrinsic hash rate economics of crypto mining. And so deploying capital is another thing, but we still grew. So, for example, in 2022, we mined an equivalent. Uh, we mined digital assets equivalent of Bitcoin, 4,752 Bitcoin, 4,752 Bitcoin. Okay, the year before we did 4,032. Bitcoin in 2021. We mined the most crypto in 2021 than any other public company. Anybody, anybody, Marathon, Riot, you name it, we mined more than them. Okay. We were the only one to mine 4,000 in 2021. In 2022, we had 18% growth. Think of that. That's a healthy growth number with no leverage. We didn't borrow any money. We didn't encumber our Bitcoin and get a bunch of margin calls and go bankrupt or for $100 million on A6 and then have to give them up because we can't afford the debt servicing. Because as you know, when half street economics thin out during a bear market, you know, in some cases you can barely, you can mine at break even or a little bit of profit. If you have that much debt on top, you're, you're going to go under, right? So yeah. we grow methodically to make money, right? And when we did deploy capital, we replaced and upgraded a bunch of our legacy fleet. Because again, High was a legacy miner, been around since 2017. I didn't bit farms are also legacy miners. You got some of the new American names that came out of nowhere, raised 300 million bucks last year, bought a bunch of S19s, didn't know where to plug them in. They're still in boxes. They bought them for 90 bucks a terahash. We're buying them from them for 11 bucks a terahash. That's fine. That's the game, but that's the game, right? You have to know the rules yeah. of the game if you want to win. And we had a balance sheet to do it. And, and uh, because we were really strict on the cash management. Hmm. Uh, uh, and, and I think the other, the other part is, in that, that equation, um, 
that le lends itself. We started hearing rumblings in Texas. We started hearing difficulties this time last year, and uh, we were going to expand into Texas. And we just started pulling back, you know, just uh, uh, let's be really cautious here because there's just too many of these conferences which are so helpful to attend and, and you get gossip and you have to put sunglasses on to, to try to, uh, uh, I guess the better word is arbitrage the information. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, surely uh, Texas became a crowded uh, playground and, um, and it became a problem. So we, we did duck that. Uh, and, and I think the, the other part is this idea of getting revenue from other sources. Really, we did investments in other companies, um, and we're, we're, we're always thinking of these other revenue channels. Uh, and I think that that's a, that's a big difference, uh, just a Bitcoin miner, because I said it earlier, one of the things I'm focused on as a money manager in, in a metric that's so key is cash flow return on investor capital. If you just buy the best stocks in any industry that is they have the highest cash flow returns on best capital, they'll perform. And so our discipline uh, in capital allocation, as I just said, is this, this model, the cash flow return on invested capital is an overarching strategy when we take a look at uh, other opportunities for, can this be a source of revenue for us? So delving more into that topic and kind of staying with the Ethereum mining for a second, is this more of an operational question for you guys about like meeting in the morning, going through Excel spreadsheets, seeing where the margins are, or is it on the flip side, on the production side, where you guys are making like really uh, smart decisions with how you're deploying capital, how many people you employ, where you're putting your name down? Uh, is it all of the above? It's all, all of the above, above right? Yeah. Because the thing is, is once you once you deploy the capital, right, you have to monitor it, right? You have to have good uptime. So. I talked about two resources. I talked about managing energy, where do you divert it, hash rate, selling it back to the grid. The second resource was um, capital. And the third resource is technology, right? So where do we apply our, our technology to optimize the business? So we did a massive overhaul in New Brunswick. We rebuilt our entire software stack. We sent a bunch of um, high-end, we bought some high-end Dell servers because here's the thing. Managing a hundred ASICs, a thousand ASICs, ten thousand ASICs, right? You 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 have different issues with scale, right? And so your system has to sweep tens of thousands. Like we have we have tens of thousands of ASICs now globally, and your system has to sweep because if you're just looking at the pool, you're not going to know what machines are offline. You know, yeah. I mean, it might say these workers are offline, but where the hell yeah. are they? Right. <laughs> so you have to have a local system what I call the API level in the mine, right? And you have to have your MAC address, your location, your your ASIC temperature, right? And ideally you should have a heat map to understand how the thermodynamics are all working in the facility. Yeah. But the point is, if you've got 10,000 machines and one of them goes dead, where the hell is it? And what's what wrong with it? You have to pull out the rack and, and repair the hashboard or you just got to reboot it. And so it's having that software management system that allows us to also have the highest Bitcoin for exahash in the sector. So what happens is when you get to this scale, people talk about future projections and hundreds of megawatts and all these exahash. But the thing is, is this is like civic grade allocation of resources. We have two substations at New Brunswick, a 30 megawatt and a 50 megawatt. Okay. We have high voltage engineers. We have power technicians coming out to service the, the substations. Back in the day when you're running five, 10 megawatts, you're getting maybe a four kilovolt line from a utility company, everything upstream from there, that's not your problem. That's utility company, right? So you've just got this little hut that you have to worry about, right? But when you're when you're doing exahashes and you know you're pushing substations, you have a city to manage, right? And so you have to you have to have not just data center technicians, you need infrastructure technicians. And that is where people are crippling or collapsing under their own weight. And how do you know this? Look at the Bitcoin for exa hash triggers put out month by month by month. Okay. You would think that everybody would be within plus minus five, 10% of each other. They're not. You're seeing companies that are 40%. Like we did 110 Bitcoin per exa hash this month. Some of our peers, no names, are doing 64 Bitcoin per exa hash. It doesn't make any sense. Why? Because they're mining. Well, they're bigger. It's okay. They're bigger. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's but, like, but we have bigger cash flow because we get 100 and 100. You know, I think that's the, what I am just trying to share with you. And I, I think the morning, you know, the morning meeting is interesting because sometimes you want to vent. Someone wants to, uh, you know, has a 
just wants to get something off their chest. And we listen to him. We say, okay, great. Well, we'll take that offline and we'll chat about that later. It's important. You're important to our team. But we'll talk to you later. And and we keep this momentum. So when I was out buying a bunch of, uh, of these S19 Pros from different vendors, well, they're coming in. Well, where are they? Every day, where are they? Well, they're getting in the tax. They're in the zone. They're going to they're going to be trucked up. But what day are they? Every morning, we are relentless in asking, you know, where are the machines? When are they get plugged in? Because yeah. that's the life of a business. It's our oxygen. And one one weekend, we had guys in, in New Brunswick get their own truck, basically load up a bunch of machines and drove for eight hours to La Chute and plug them in. I love well, that. Oh, we're going to wait, and that'll be two weeks to get a, a, a contractor, either go move them and do all this stuff. No, no, now, immediately. And and that cadence, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we give bonuses. Everyone gets bonuses when we meet Exahash. Uh, every Exahash is a huge touchdown celebration for everyone. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and our people come first. It's something about so important. Uh, and everyone's focused on that cash flow return on invested capital. Uh, when when energy prices went through the roof, and in Canada they put a twenty five percent tax on your on your gas tank, well, that really affects a lot of workers. Right? It it, it, it their costs within within twenty four hours. Okay, uh, you know everyone gets a thousand dollars a month more. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want you to worry about putting gas in your car, food in your belly, and, and feeding your kids. I want you to worry about the machines. Yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 that's what we did. We we pivot so quickly. Yeah. Uh and and, and that's because of our structure. And I and I think uh I, you know is it, it's just doing a, a wonderful job on and on pushing this culture. And I'm a big believer it's culture. We went to do diligence. Like I kind of mentioned the other company. When we looked at another company, do we buy them? Yes or no. And what I was sharing with you is really important. We went in and they didn't know what machines were off they didn't even know this we did diligence on another on a competitor we were going to acquire an asset a distressed asset so we sent our guys in there and they're like okay well your uptime's pardon my language trash um and so let's have a look and so they said you know what's going on so they walk around they go well, we'll just look for the red lights what do you mean look for the red like it's it's like it's like you know, it's like, you know, I, I don't know. Yikes. Archaic, archaic, right? And so the point is they didn't have the software management system, right? Yeah. So that's what I was get referring to when I said we update our entire software stack. Because the thing is, is like your API calls, when you have that many machines, it needs to be fluid and it needs to be quick, right? Mm -hmm. And and the other thing is, is like, even if a company had a software stack that worked for a thousand machines, you're going to need to upgrade that when you get to 10,000 machines, right? And this company in particular, they didn't even have that kind of stack. They're just relying on, you know, the the staff to go around and, and look for red lights. And so this is this is where you're seeing the difference. You got to look at the companies with the best Bitcoin for Exahash. You've got to look for the companies that have, how, how are they managing their, their balance sheet as well, right? Because, you know, as, as a crypto miner, you've got some companies that are just going 100% HODL. And 100% sell, sell our Bitcoin. And if you talk to an investment banking analyst, they're going to say, well, you, you've got to, management has to exercise some discretion and it's got to fall somewhere in the middle. And that's what we did, right? So we sold Ethereum, which was such a high yield, high profit margin business. And we use that to leapfrog in our ASIC business, right? So we could grow faster. Ethereum mining is more complicated. Guess what? We love challenges, right? Oh, the merge is coming up. Guess what? Everyone was like, oh, you guys are going to turn off all the GPUs and everything's going to become obsolete. You know, I was trying to tell them, I'm like, guys, you have to understand hash rate economics. There's going to be a recoil effect as all the different miners migrate to different altcoins. It's the guys with the most efficient machines and the cheap power. It's a last man standing analogy. There's always a revenue floor in crypto mining. The whole thing won't fall dead on its feet. And surely enough, what happened? After the merge, we repurposed all our GPUs. We started mining all coins in a profit maximizer. So, but we do it with it. There's a compliment of Iden saying, sorry to interrupt Iden, is, is that we take this GPU chip and you layer on artificial intelligence and, and, and it goes out to all the altcoins and it just mines for minutes, whoever is the most profitable, immediately converting into Bitcoin. 
And all of a sudden, uh, and when any time you get a rally in Bitcoin, the altcoins out outperform. So therefore, you actually, you get this huge uh, expansion in your profitability. Yeah, I get that. So, right. so we're using, uh, we have some old GPU chips that are, that, that are like antiquated like me. And, uh, and, and it's amazing that we put those things to work and they're making money for us. Uh, mm -hmm. that it's, but it's the AI component, which you have to add on to it. So that's the creativity I just uh, sharing with you is, uh, we got a, we got B, how we put them together to get one on one. Can we make a lap? I love the focus on the small things. I, I want to pivot and ask you about the, the Intel chips. And I think it sort of falls within the thread of our conversation, honestly. That was seen as like an interesting move. Like I remember when that Intel announcement came out, there was like Block was going to buy them. Argo, you guys, I think Grid at one point was involved with this. And people are wondering like, are they gonna get the machine or is it just the chip? Seems like you guys were the first to really get the allocation and deploy them and you had to make your own machine, right? So how does that fall into line with your guys' ethos of like keeping control of the small things, keeping control of margins, being up to date on all the infrastructure inside your buildings. Because building your own machine, like that's a lot of risk, right? A lot of risk. I, I share with you as as an outsider is is I was so thrilled to see the passion and, and, and the curiosity and the drive by Iden and Bill uh, going back and forth with her and how his council gave who joined us from GPU One, um, I stay up there late at night, so at two o'clock in the morning calls with China, uh, making sure and then negotiating back with Intel. Uh, I, I, you know, the leadership of, of Iden on, on spearheading that with Bill uh, Gray and, and uh, Gabe uh, was unbelievable. And so I, I'm really honored to see this young team gel like this and work all day, get up early morning for, for Vancouver, 7 a.m. call is the first call. And then two o'clock that night, 2 a.m. is now talking to China. Uh, and so other people thought, oh, it's really easy. We'll just send it over here. The, like it, capital markets are so easy to get money from that there was so much money wasted just buying uh, Bitmain machines. And, they, and there was one place, 65,000 of them were sitting on the floor. Yeah. For instant gear. For almost a year so, so you, you you just see a sort of mismanagement whereas uh we having we have uh, anxiety butterflies in our belly if they're sitting around not doing something and and but i is, is the guy that's uh, really did a wonderful job uh with the intel and now other people want our buzz miner the approach we took is so first of all all those companies you you named they were all proponents they all had the same opportunity that we did, but we were first and we were the only ones who's, who've executed so far. And moreover, we we're the only ones who've got 130 terahash miner. And th that's very important for, for several reasons, just in execution, right? That like Frank said, everyone talks that a lot of people go raise money, but it's about actually executing. So I started my career off as a radio frequency engineer, I bring to uh, manufacturing facilities in, in Korea. I've been to research laboratories in France, cutting edge stuff, right? And so I understand the entire process of prototyping on a test bench, you know, optimizing, developing a product for mass production. And then there's something called factory engineering. Factory engineering is its own discipline. Okay. So there's hardware, mechanical, software, firmware, radio frequency. Okay. All discipline, they're factory engineering. And you have to understand the controls and processes at the factory. It doesn't matter if you're making an iPhone or a mouse or a crypto miner. And so what we did was we hired a QA engineer, 20 year industry veteran, and he quarantined for three weeks. And then he lived in the factory town at the factory. So we could implement our own physical test rig controls and processes, right? And we also worked with an established ODM um, that Intel have rapport with, but the other, the other companies from what I heard or what they were telling me is that they're like, yeah, we're going to do an immersion. We're going to do a solar powered. Like it's like a, it's like a mousetrap on a unicycle and you don't even have the wheel figured out. yet. Like, what are you talking about? Right. It like, you're going to do a flying car with like, you know, and so the thing is, is I'm like, let's build the model T Ford. Let's perfect it. Let's crank out 5,000 of them. 
And then, you know, if you want to build a convertible or you want to put a cool spoiler on it or whatever, we could do that. Right. And so this is the thing, right? Like the reason why Hive is first is because we take the first step and we land our feet securely. Right. And so even just getting back to our 22 production numbers, you know, in 2021, nobody would really made much, much Bitcoin. Uh, and so in 2022, people said, oh, we grew 600%. We grew 800%. I said, like, yeah, but you grew from nothing. So of course you're going to have the, this huge number, right? And at what cost? So the thing is, is you talked about risk and, you know, where, where I see risk, if you don't take control of your own destiny and you don't get very clear created, is you're at the whim of the Chinese manufacturers, Bit, Meme, Rico, BT, Canaan. Well, guess what? Try buying ASICs in a bull market. The reason why people blow their brains out paying 90 bucks a tera ash is like, shit, we raise all this capital. The bankers are expecting us to go ahead and deploy. We we made this colorful, pretty chart showing we're going to be at 10x a hash by the end of the year. By the way, Mr. Market's going to reward us if we just do more future projections. And it just got into this massive greater fool theory of, you know, how much ASICs can we tie up? It almost became like an ASIC proxy game where it's just like, yeah. let's raise enough money spend all the money on that first deposit. Oh shoot, we still have 30, 40% left to pay. Um, and then everybody got in the glue, right? So we're all about methodical, successive and effective expansions. And the great thing about our deal with Intel is that it was a fixed price supply agreement that blew the economics out of the water mm. and everything else. In addition to them being a Fortune 500 company, in addition to us having granularity down to the operating frequency of the ASICs. So we were able to look at the entire dynamic range of this product and we studied the thermodynamics, we studied, studied the electronics and uh, we really um, pushed the envelope. There was things that Intel just could not know on themselves at the laboratory level. We've deployed thousands of these things and we give them feedback. Mm -hmm. right? And so now in the future, um, we'll, we'll be able to have nice, stable fixed price supply chain. And again, look when we, that, so it's kind of like a hedge. It's like an option, right? It's like, we, this is our fixed price that we know we can buy at, right? It's like energy, right? And when the market dips, right. And we can buy stuff at 11 bucks a tera hash. Thank you very much. When the market goes crazy and things are a hundred bucks a tera hash, guess what? We've got our nice flat stable, yeah. all low technology. This was two resources, technology and capital, right? So it was actually risk of risk management, not, not taking this. A, a follow-up question if I can on Intel. Um, and I don't know if you guys are able to answer this, but I'll ask it anyways. How frustrated were they having to work with companies that didn't you know, end up buying these chips or they, they made announcements for allocations and then didn't do anything with them? Because uh, you don't know, because we, cause we, we, we came through, we delivered. So... Mm -hmm. Um, I guess it's kind of like, you know, asking the guy who just crossed the, the, the finish line at a marathon, what's it like to not finish the race? So I, I don't know. <laughs> we finish, we cross the finish line, right? Um, I, I can only imagine it was frustrating for them. Yeah. And we're up to more frustrating was the crypto winner. Yeah. Uh, it, there, there are so many external forces and, um, we showed that we didn't falter, you know, we, we. We toned back, you know, we pulled back on this sheer size we had, we renegotiated, but we never, ever stopped that we're going to deliver this product. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and so I, I think that that shows the fortitude of the high management team uh, yeah. and, and the ingenuity in a bear market. It's easy in a bull market. Uh, yeah. But now, now what are we going to do to grow? What are we going to do to grow the business? Because something that really shocks me uh, when we were doing our press release last week, is the difficulty has surged fifty percent in the past year? Sixty, so, yeah. Yeah, the difficulty. You know that 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 means you, there's more competition. Well, where's it coming from? What countries are it coming from? We know it's not Texas. We know it's not you know these other places. So, uh, uh, and how long will this last? Well, we lived through this with Ethereum. We couldn't believe how fast Ethereum's difficulty was rising. And we were scrambling, saying, okay, how do we manage this issue? And so we feel we're back into that that that, that managing the Ethereum drama of, of the, the coin was going up, but so is the difficulty rapidly. And how do you maintain your margins? Uh, yeah. So that's something, you know, for this year, it is, is that Bitcoin goes back to 40,000. Just think of where the difficulty is going to be. 
Definitely. Uh, and that's a great place to turn the conversation as we like start to close is what does 2023 build for you guys? I mean, like you said, difficulties go only going up and it's becoming more pressing. And oh, there's a lot of other players buying cheap ASICs right now and finding places to plug them in. We're going to have a lot of due. We've been doing a lot of due diligence on acquisitions and looking at things and they just weren't attractive. Uh, and, and yeah, we, we don't, we have a very winning management team and, uh, we're not going to have that diluted. Um, that's just how we focus. Uh, and so we will continue to do that. We are looking for other sources of good green energy. We do not want to go out and take a big risk. Uh, we had an ATM out and we stopped it in November. So we were able to buy all those machines from internal cash management. Uh, and, and so we're much more focused on a gradual growth until there's some more clarity. And I said earlier that these cycles, these, these, these meltdowns take at least 13 months before you get a real serious model. And we still don't have a lot of the regulatory pronouncements. Um, and there's lots of this uncertainty in this ecosystem. Who else is going to go bankrupt? We don't know. So we're going to be very cautious and thoughtful and take 10 megawatts over there and 21 megawatts over here and retrofit them with these high performing machines. Uh, and, and that's how we're going to uh, grow. We're not going to go and say, okay, let's scale this to 80 megawatts and, and build something huge at this stage uh, until the market gets some stability to it. Love that. I know you guys have to run. Uh, Frank, Iden, thank you so much for your time. Looking forward to the best for High Blockchain and hopefully speak to you both again soon. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Will.